Travelers and City, and Travelers had an umbrella, and, and Citibank is a word, you know, in the lowercase thing of a T is an umbrella, you stick an arc on the top and you got it. I mean, it didn't take, you know, it's like it's a second, you know, it's all over the world. Like, how can it be that you talk to somebody and it's done in a second? But it is done in a second. It's done in a second in 34 years. You know, it's done in a second, and every experience and every movie and every thing of my life that's in my head. So both these stories capture with something we all understand on a deep intuitive level, but our creative egos sort of have a hard time accepting, and that's the idea that creativity is common and sorrow, that nothing is entirely original, that everything builds on what came before, that we create by taking existing pieces of skill and knowledge and insight and inspiration that we gather over the course of our lives and then recombining them into these incredible new things. So this is what I want to talk about today. These ideas of network knowledge, like the documenting of the Fort Legion and combinatorial creativity, which is at the heart of what both Picasso and Paul Scher described. This idea that in order for us to truly create and contribute to the world, we have to be able to connect capital dots and cross-pollinate ideas from a multitude of disciplines and recombine these pieces to create something new. Kind of like Legos. The more of these pieces we have, the more diverse we should the more, sorry, can you hear me? Okay. The more pieces we have, the more different, the more diverse, the more interesting the castles will become that we build. And uh, if we only have one shape and color, this greatly limits how much we can create, even within our one area of expertise. Um, take Einstein, for example. He famously attributed some of his greatest breakthroughs in physics to his violin breaks because he believed that they connected different parts of his brain in new ways. And a kind of novelist, Vladimir Nabokov, who was a sacred lepidopterist. He studied and collected butterflies religiously. He believed that it was this scholarly obsession that allowed him to develop and hone his, his skill for, for detail and precision, which translated into really rich and vivid and crisp literature. Of course, these ideas of combinatorial creativity and cross-pollinating ideas are not at all new. In the last half century alone, they've been iterated and reiterated over and over and over again in just about every cultural discipline. 
1952, designer Alvin Lustig wrote in an essay on design education. He said, I have found that all positions men take in their beliefs are profoundly influenced by thousands of small, often imperceptible experiences that slowly accumulate to form a sum total of choices and decisions. In 1964, neuropsychologist Roger Sparrow drew an analogy between neurons and ideas, and he said, ideas cause ideas and help evolve new ideas. They interact with each other and with other mental forces in the same brain as the neighboring brains, and thanks to global communication and far distant foreign brains. In 1970, French molecular biologist Jacques Minot proposed what he called the abstract kingdom, essentially a place that's analogous to the biosphere populated by ideas, which propagate much like organisms do in the natural world. He said, ideas that pertain to the properties of organisms like them, they tend to perpetuate their structure and to breathe. They too confuse and recombine, segregate their content. Minot talked about spreading power and said ideas propagate infectively. We see this today in the language of viral content. And perhaps most famously, in 1976, Richard Dawkins wrote his seminal book, The Selfish Gene, which, by the way, I highly recommend. And in it, he coined the term meme for a very similar concept. He said, examples of means are tunes, ideas, catchphrases, clothes, fashions, ways of making pots and building marshes. Just as genes propagate themselves in the gene pool when they break the body and body and use birds or eggs, so means propagate themselves in the meme pool when they can break the brain via process of gene process to be called imitation. And I like this last part, because we've all heard the cliche over and over and over again, imitation is a sincere form of flattery. But I think when it comes to this domino effect of ideas, imitation is actually the sincerest form of ideation. And just last year, um, Stephen Johnson in the excellent Where Good Ideas Come From wrote, the great driver of scientific and technological innovation in the last 600 years has been the increase in our ability to reach out and share and ideas with other people, and to borrow from the people's conscious and combine it with our conscious and turn them into something new. Now, the way I think of it is like this. We go through the world and, and we gather information. And if we're thoughtful enough, we synthesize that as an insight, which in turn gives us an idea. Then we take these ideas, ours and those of others, and we sort of toss them into our mental reservoir, where they sit and float around until one day they float into just the right alignment to flip into a new idea. Now, implicit to this concept of combinatorial creativity is also the admission that nothing is original, that everything does build on what came before. And that's kind of hard to, hard to deal with. But there's also plenty of evidence for it in just about every great discipline. In art, Nina Paley took um, archaeological artifacts from the Metropolitan Museum of Art and photographed them and animated them to illustrate her point, which is that everything builds on what came before, and, and all creative work is essentially derivative work. It takes two to make a thing go right. With famous books, the first time is already the second, since we approach them already knowing them. The cautious common saying of rereading the classics turns out to be an innocent veracity. We are always somehow rereading a classic because we have encountered some previous incarnation of it, a refraction in other stories, texts or versions. What are the many versions, if not diverse perspectives of a movable event, if not a long experimental assortment of omissions and emphases? But in design, 
there's a great flicker set of similarities that kind of digs out examples of graphic design that borrows heavily from older work and puts the two side by side. And just recently, this great joint cycling poster for Cycling in London made rounds as the, some of you might recognize probably the older of you is based on illustrations from Alice Comfort's 1972 manual, The Joy of Sex. <laughs> and of course, uh, the mother of all recent remix culture studies, this wonderful four part documentary called Everything is a Remix by Kirby Ferguson, who's actually here today, uh, which I didn't know until last night. Um, and in this excerpt from the second part of the film, he looks at one of the most celebrated examples of creativity and entertainment to illustrate the point about remix culture. Films are built on other films, as well as on books, TV shows, actual events, plays, whatever. This applies to everything from the lowliest genre film right on up to revered indie fare. And it even applies to massively influential blockbusters, the kinds of films that reshape pop culture. Which brings us to... Even now, Star Wars endures as a work of impressive imagination, but many of its individual components are as recognizable as the samples in a remix. The foundation for Star Wars comes from Joseph Campbell. He popularized the structures of myth in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Star Wars follows the outline of the monomyth, which consists of stages like the call to adventure, supernatural aid, the belly of the whale, the road of trials, the meeting with the goddess, and a bunch more. Also huge influences were the Flash Gordon serials from the 30s and Japanese director Akira Kurosawa. Star Wars plays much like an updated version of Flash Gordon, right down to the soft wipes and the opening titles design. From Kurosawa, we get masters of spiritual martial arts, a low-ranking bickering duo, and more soft wipes, a beneath the floorboards hideaway, and a boastful baddie getting his arm chopped off. You just watch yourself. We're wanted men. I have the death sentence on 12, system. War films and westerns were also huge sources for Star Wars. The scene where Luke discovers his slaughtered family resembles this scene from The Searchers. And the scene where Han Solo shoots Greedo resembles this scene from The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. The climactic airstrikes in the Dam Busters, 633 Squadron, and the bridges at Toko Ri play very similarly to the run in the Death Star. And in many cases, existing shots were even used as templates for Star Wars special effects. There's also many other elements clearly derived from various films. We have a tin man like the tin woman in Metropolis, a couple shots inspired by 2001, a grab the girl and swing scene like this one in the seventh voyage of Sinbad, a holographic projection kind of like the one in Forbidden Planet, a rally resembling this one in Triumph of the Will, and cute little robots much like those in Silent Running. George Lucas collected materials, he combined them, he transformed them. Without the films that preceded it, there could be no Star Wars. Creation requires influence. Everything we make is a remix of existing creations, our lives, and the lives of others. There's so much excitement today in laws about the open source movement, which is great, but a lot of its principles are hailed as some sort of revolutionary, groundbreaking thing, whereas they're really pretty much as old as human civilization. As we see, creativity itself is the original open source code. And, and what enables this growth of creativity is a rich pool of resources to derive from. And I believe the two main mechanisms of how we fill that number of resources are curiosity and choice. Curiosity is one of the most fundamental human drivers. Even, even looking at little kids, this hunger to to know the world and to explore is, is deep in our species DNA. One of my big creative and curatorial heroes, Jim Kudal, once said, our number one value isn't any of the skills we have, it's that we're essentially curious. But curiosity alone without direction can be pretty much a, a worthless endeavor in the sense that it's very distracting and unguided and can take a lot of time. 
choice is how we tailor and direct and channel our curiosity, so where we choose to allocate our time and energy and resources, ultimately what we choose to pay attention to. Harvard Sway Christensen writes, your decisions about allocating your personal time, energy, and talent ultimately shape your love strategy. And here's Susan Sontag, one of my favorite authors of mine, says, do stuff, be clenched, be curious, not made into an inspiration show for society's kiss in the forehead. Pay attention, it's all about paying attention. Attention is vitality, connects with others, it makes you eager, stay eager. Much of Buddha's philosophy centers around this same idea, what's being phrased as intention and attention, our intentional curiosity to know the world and to learn and to grow, and our intentional focus of where to allocate our mental resources and what to pay attention to. Now, this, I think, is the role of the information curators. There are curiosity shirkers that lead us to think that we didn't know we're interested in until, well, until we are, until someone whose taste and opinion we value pointed us, pointed our attention to them, and we discover them, and we integrate them with our existing knowledge, and they become another node in our, in our network knowledge, and another Lego brick in our combinatorial creativity. So if information discovery plays such a central role to how we feed and fuel our creativity, then content curation in and of itself is a form of creative labor. And yet our current code of ethics for how we honor and recognize and credit this form of labor is completely inadequate. We have fairly well-established systems for crediting text and image and video and different media. We have entire manuals and that stuff. And even if we choose to violate it, we know enough, we understand enough to know that we're violating it. But when it comes to information discovery and content curation, we don't have so much of basic literacy about how to credit properly or, or even why we should. Which is kind of odd because in a, in a culture of constantly proliferating information overload, which we hear about every day, it's through these human filters, these human sense makers, human synapses, if you will, that this very text or image or video finds its way into our mental pool of resources. Um, I think it's quite telling that the amount of work that went into the Forlegium made them the most lavish and expensive books to produce in time. And I have to wonder, when did we lose this sort of creative meritocracy that helps us recognize this form of creative labor? When did we stop valuing the enormous amount of time and effort and energy and thought that goes into culling and collecting ideas that ultimately shape humanity's creative and intellectual direction? So I think when we choose not to credit, when we choose not to recognize this form of labor, we are robbing someone of their creative labor, and we're essentially perpetrating another form of piracy. And whether we call it link love or, or via crediting, it's really easy to do online, yet there's precious little of it. Which is a little bit sad, because I think for, for publishers and curators, it's not really about getting traffic or linkbacks or, or monetization or any of these awful SEO terms. It's about something much more deeply human, something that I believe underpins pretty much every human aspiration and action from, from the obvious acts of like, suicide bombers to the most beautiful work by the greatest artists and poets. And that's the desire to matter, to feel seen, to feel like our work is being recognized, our, our creative and intellectual labor is of value to humanity. Here's that um, Kevin Kelly, founder of Wired and Futurist and, and brilliant, brilliant man. Says over the next century, these scholars and fans, aided by computational algorithms, will knit together the books of the world into a single network literature. A reader will be able to generate a social graph of an idea or a timeline of a process or a network graph of notebooks for any notion of the library. They will come to understand that no work, no idea stands alone, but that all good, true, and beautiful things are networks, ecosystems, and internal parts, related entities, and similar works. So it's my hope that we'll find a way to respect and credit these, these human synapses of network knowledge and enablers of combinatorial creativity, and to codify that respect, and to indoctrinate it, and to ingrain it in our existing cultural framework of how we think about creativity, and intellectual property, and information systems, and human labor. I think we live in a rare time when we have an opportunity to, to set these roles, and, and these standards, and these norms, and the honorable way of doing things. And this, I believe, is our responsibility as publishers and curators and even consumers of information. 
I um, think it all comes down to choice again, because the normative models that we choose today are going to shape how much our culture values this form of creative labor tomorrow. I like these um, words from Gandhi. He says, our thoughts become our words, our words become our actions, and our actions become our character, our character becomes our destiny. How we pay attention, how we, what we choose to value, how we choose to relate to information to each other, shapes who we become. It shapes our good destiny, and ultimately shapes our entire experience of this world. And in my mind, there's hardly anything <coughs> more important than that. Thank you. We do this a lot as designers where we're obviously influenced by things, sometimes consciously and a lot of times unconsciously. So I was just thinking, as you were saying this, would it be a value to start acknowledging those sources? So for example, if I just put together a poster and I probably um, reference three historical works and two contemporary works, like. Should I, should I maybe like acknowledge that somewhere and list that out and explain what went into it? Okay, um, so in the actual, so when we're thinking about the actual image that you create, I mean, this falls more within the traditional category of how we credit, you know, traditional media, in which case you wouldn't have to unless, you know, whatever the copyright restrictions are. So if you're not going to be using it in a probate, probably not. But what I would like to see is because you're an influencer in the design community, when you design this poster, chances are you're going to write about it, you're going to blog about it, or someone's going to write about it. And I would love to see your creative process and in the writing about it. So this information that you're going to package up and curate for your audience, I would love to hear what influenced you, what, how you discovered it, and why, why it matters to your final product. How I discovered it. <laughs> yeah, that's so important. Yeah, okay. Over there? Sorry. Hold on, hold on. Can you talk about your creative process, about how you curate things on your Twitter feed or your blog, or how you stumble upon things and decide they're valuable to the creative community? Sure. Um, I don't sleep. <laughs> um, and I have a fairly structured routine of how I, I go through things. I have, I mean, I'm a big believer in, in what I call meta curation, which is you curate for yourself a, a, a list of sources that are sort of your primary things that you pay attention to, but then you sort of let them feed you whatever they pick on their own. And uh, so I have a, I live and die by Google Reader. I have multiple folders and categories and different, you know, kind of tags and color codes and all that. And so every morning I go through my number one top priority folder, I see what's most interesting there, and then I call it back down. I read a lot of actual books, and whether I read them as books or on the Kindle app on the iPad, I, I read a lot. And I also cannot live without Insta paper. Anyone here that's using Insta paper? Okay, yeah, yeah, I love you guys. And Insta paper loves you too. I, I, I can't, I honestly think of my life as pretty Insta paper and post Insta paper. I do so much more reading this way. And it's, I mean, you know, I'm always skeptical when I read about this, this these, these people like Nicholas Park who say how the internet is corrupting our brain, our ability to focus. But there's still something to be said for being able to focus more intensely on something because that's when you start to see these influences and you allow content to sort of penetrate your, your mental flow of resources a bit more than skimming online. And I think it's the paper's great for that. It's a huge part of my process. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, how has the content of your blog changed from the beginning six years ago to uh, today in terms of what you're paying attention to? That's a very interesting question. Um, I think it hasn't really changed in terms of the nature of the content because since the very beginning, I wanted my things to be a very cross-disciplinary thing and covering anything from design to neuroscience to art and technology. And I've always picked up bits and pieces. But I think as I've evolved, because I started when I was still in college, I, my own interest, it's always been an iteration of my own curiosity, or the direction of my own curiosity. My own curiosity has sort of picked up a few areas that I'm a little bit more interested in than others. One being remix culture, it's something I'm deeply fascinated by, one being data visualization, um, just different topics that emerge. But format-wise, actually, I mean, I've 
Great Pickers has been so experimental. I really had no idea what I was doing when I started. And originally, I mean, that's before WordPress was really so kind of dominant. So originally, I tried to do this thing where it was like a weekly magazine. So each blog post would have several <laughs> different things, which should have been separate blog posts to begin with. And so that didn't really kind of work for me. And that changed. That was more about the format. The content was better than or somewhere. <coughs> Uh, I, I also use Google Reader like a lot, and I was wondering what your coping mechanism is, like when it goes past a hundred, a thousand plus unread items, and like how do you deal with not knowing that you are unable to read everything? Okay, well, first of all, on that note, I think that's something that's a real problem for a lot of us that consume a lot of information. And recently, there was an NPR essay called something like. Erica might remember, the, the, the strange and beautiful thing that we're going to miss almost everything and that's okay. I think that was the title, something like that. And I highly recommend it. It's, it's a really profound piece of writing and it's so relevant to most of us. But for my own process, um, I try to go through most things in my top priority folder, which is very selective. I mean, it's like Swiss Miss and like seven other blogs, you know? <laughs> There's really very little in it. Um, but even so, sometimes I don't manage. And I made this routine where at 11.30 every Sunday night, I mark all as red. Like, I declare Google Reader bankruptcy. Um, but, and, and I'm okay with that, because to me, the main value of Google Reader is really the search function. So I subscribe to my own Twitter feed in RSS and to a handful of other Twitter feeds in RSS so that I can later go and search. And if I'm doing an article on something, I can see who mentioned it or what's been written in the past in the blogs that I follow, rather than doing a Google search about it, which is going to give me like just Unfurated general theme. What sort of books do you actually read? What sort of books do I actually read? Uh, I don't read fiction, I'm embarrassed to say, um, especially because someone that's very important to me is currently writing fiction, uh, which is hard and I'm starting to read. But I read a lot of a lot of nonfiction. Um, most of it has to do more with sort of cross-disciplinary stuff that has an aspect of psychology in it, but also applies to business and design and things like this. Um, some of my favorite nonfiction writers, Jonah Lehrer, uh, Cleveland Johnson, and I also read a lot of, I mean, I've realized in the course, of, but the funny thing about content creation, whatever you call it, is that it's essentially a function of this radical hole of information. So you find something and then you click, you find something else, you find something else, but the byproduct of that is that you realize how much you don't know, you know, and it can be very frustrating. So I've recently realized that I haven't read a lot of kind of classic mid-century books, especially on, on design, you know. And having grown up in communist Bulgaria, I missed out like a whole lot of stuff, you know. So I've been reading a lot of old books too. Uh, at what point do you feel that uh, homage and influence become a big? Well, I think anything comes down to whether you're making cultural commentary with your work. If any any work of art or, or any creative product that is of value, I think, is one that, that is making some sort of comment on culture. And how aesthetically similar or not something is, to me, doesn't really matter. What matters is are you making a comment that's identical to what the original author did, or are you making a new comment? To me, that's a little fun. Uh, I've been thinking about the fact that curation, in some ways, the way that you're talking about it, has been a part of the role of the critic or of the scholar or of someone who is considered to be, you know, an official creator of new ideas. And I wondered about your thoughts about, you know, what does it mean to sort of liberate that role, or do you see it actually as a form of all of those things, as sort of curation as a form of criticism and scholarship? And that you certainly consider it creative. So I think you can speak a little bit about that. I think part of it is all of these things, but I also think it's a little bit arrogant for content curators to think that they can be experts. There's a really big difference, and I think there's still a space in culture for, for scholars and, and critics and people like this. I think the role of curators is really to generate public interest in something so that people begin to care about it enough to find out more about it and to kind of go into the literature and go into the academic world or, or kind of the real world of criticism about that subject, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was wondering 
doing a it seems like you're advocating mixing as many different ideas as possible and just mashing. As many different ideas as possible and just you know, remixing, I guess. Um, so what extent do you think I guess copyright laws restrict creativity? Well, copyright law is not a specialty. I'm sure Kirby would know more about it, but I, I would say I will say this. Um, when we think about the, the Shepherd Fairy case with AP, I don't know, I mean most people are familiar because we've done a poster child for for kind of how copyright hinders something that's considered culturally valuable. I think copyright at its core is there for a good reason. It's trying to protect artists and then to sort of respect the contribution of the world. But I think the second that it begins to hinder something that is of positive value to the majority. So if it's some sort of quote-unquote output is being hindered by copyright law, if it's for the good of the group, you know, in a very kind of socialist sounding <laughs> way, I think then copyright law is a problem then. Um, could you just give a few more details about that Flora Lee Joan, am I pronouncing it correctly, that what's right in front of us? When was it made and was it the monks that actually put it together or who was doing these remixes with the documents? So they were mostly there in kind of medieval Europe. Um, started around the 13th century through around the 17th century. It, it was done mostly by scholars and I don't know if, if monks were, I mean I'm not really sure what the hierarchy of whether the scholars were within the church system or not, but they were kind of famous, the famous scholars would flip out, physically take excerpts from the books and compile them into new volumes that explain some, some idea that's kind of current to that culture of that era in a way that no single work was able to explain fully. So it was kind of an exercise of doing a bird's eye view, almost like in academia today, you do meta-analysis where you take existing studies and sort of do a study of studies, it's sort of like that. And I'm thinking about a hundred years, somebody's going to talk about brain maker. <laughs> 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 Maria. It's actually the funny thing about Florida Legion is it sounds so familiar to the concept of it. If you think about it, it's Tumblr. It's essentially Tumblr. The, the platform of Tumblr is so, and it's amazing the, the amount of work that went into Florida Legion made it really hard for most people to do. There were a handful of people. But we're so fortunate to live in a time when anyone can do it, and the barrier of entry is so low. I think it's incredible. They invite you to do that. Thank you so much, Maria.